Well, the Lord be with all of you all. And with you. And with you. Um, let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we come before you today to marvel at your eternal story. Open our hearts and minds to your love and grace as we seek to deepen our relationships with you and with the world. Bless this time, Lord God, in Christ's name. Amen. 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 So um, mm -hmm. today, today I didn't give anybody any homework um, because I figured I'll give you that for next week and we can start reading this wonderful gospel together. Um, if you've been at church at all this year or worshiping in your places of worship, you know this is the year B and year B is the gospel of Mark year of the three year uh, lectionary series. And um, probably in a perfect world, we should have started this back in January, but there you go. Um, but it's been fascinating to me as we jump through Mark um, each week. And I kept saying to Cammie, you know, it'd be great to just kind of follow along with, um, with Mark. So that's kind of why we're developing this study. Um, so today I'm just going to kind of go over what the different, what the four gospels are. And then next week we will fully jump into what was special about Mark. Um, but here's a couple of things. Um, I think you all know what a gospel his translated is the gospel means good news, um, which is pretty interesting given Sunday's gospel reading is about the beheading of John the Baptist and where that's good news I have yet to figure out, but I'll tell you on Sunday. Um, and each gospel um, has different audiences. Um, each of the writers um, tended to be writing to a specific group. Um, for example, in um, Mark, um, that's the earliest gospel. I don't know why it goes Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It should go Mark, Luke, Matthew, and John, but it doesn't in the canon. Um, but it's the earliest gospel. Um, and as you look at different, you can, you can Google this. You can see where Matthew and Luke um, borrowed um, a whole lot from um, Mark's gospel. Um, in the very first line of Mark's gospel, um, he tells the people, Mark, the writer of Mark tells the people, this is the son of man, the Messiah. Um, so he is, this whole book is gonna be about him showing mm -hmm. Jesus's authority over people. Um, but what we need to remember when we're looking at this is, he was not the one, he had no real contact with Jesus. He may have been at the upper room when Jesus came back. He may have been at Gethsemane as a serving boy, but he was not one of the apostles. So he's declaring Jesus's works, but not his words. Um, and he's declaring his works um, because he, the words and the stories he's telling are actually uh, St. Peter's words and recollections of his time, Simon Peter's time with the Lord. So that's kind of the intent of Mark. Um, Luke, on the other hand, Jesus, in Mark, Jesus was suffering servant. In Luke, uh, Luke was probably a Gentile. Um, he wanted to convey in his gospel that Jesus was a savior for all people. Luke wanted to make sure that Jews and non-Jews alike would be welcomed into the, the good news of Jesus. Um, he also was a physician, as you probably all have heard. Um, so he wants to make the details of Jesus's life orderly. Um, you know, he wants to take notes and have a case file. And that's, so that's the tone we get in Luke. Um, and then Matthew, as opposed to Luke writing for the Gentiles, Matthew was a Jew's Jew. A, he declares Jesus as king of the Jews. He writes him up saying he fulfilled the law and the prophets. Matthew really wanted Jews to get the fact that this guy was the real deal. And of course, died trying to. Um, 
And then finally, John is the latest of all the gospels. Um, it was written close to or around the same time as the temple was destroyed in the 70s. So Jesus was long dead. John was far removed from Jerusalem when he was writing his gospel. But John had a different agenda. We call these first three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic gospels. John's gospel was um, a stand on his own. And what he wanted to convey in his gospel, which would be a great, in the year of John, we, we need to do that study. Jesus was God. It's the same thing. You know, he, the whole, our whole um, structure of, of the Trinity is based on God's idea that Jesus was God walking on earth. Um, it was written for mature and faithful Christians who already knew the stories of Jesus. They either got them from Mark, Luke, or Matthew. Um, he was writing to establish Jesus. You know, you idiots, you didn't get it when he was here, but he was God. He was the Messiah we've been waiting for. And that's John's whole agenda. Um, and he focuses mostly on... Um, the signs, you know, this is what he did. Um, and this is what he said, you know, this is where we get the, the lines, you know, I am this and I am that. So John really, his whole agenda was um, making sure we understood the divinity of Jesus um, in a way that um, Mark saying he came to suffer for us, to take away our sins. Uh, Matthew, he is the king of the Jews. Luke, he's here to save all people. And then John wraps that up by saying, no, he was God. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so we're going to be only looking at Mark in the, in the next uh, six, seven weeks. Um, but I thought that would be helpful for you um, as just an overview. Um, and then what we see in Mark's, having just said all that, um, Mark's is the earliest, uh, scholars think. It is also the shortest, um, but it was written, as I said, um, by really by Peter. Um, the interesting piece about um, Mark was he, um, and I'll get on this on the next slide, he was highly educated. He read not only Hebrew, but Latin and Greek. And so mm -hmm. with Peter, how he ended up with Peter is a different story, but with Peter, he was a scribe. He was the young boy. Um, his cousin was Barnabas, who traveled with Paul, um, and, and probably he came along in this Christian movement initially with Barnabas and then landed with Peter. And so what Mark's gospel is and should be called really is the gospel of Peter. Don't tell any bishop I said that. But <laughs> this is this is this gospel mm -hmm. is the story. This is Peter's stories as written down by Mark the Evangelist. Um, and I think the most important thing that everybody knows, but it, it does occur 41 times um, in the Greek, he, this is, he wanted to speed through this. It was the shorthand gospel. And the word immediately, um, it says up on the screen 41 times. It's not 41 times um, of the word immediately, but words like, as soon as, or suddenly, you know, everything about this gospel is in kind of, it's not slow-mo. And so we just, that's the tenor as opposed to Luke. There were shepherds keeping watch over their flocks, but you know, there's none of that in Mark. Um, Mark even leaves out the birth story, um, which is an interesting question. All right, um, in terms of the structure of this, um, this book, is written in threes in so many ways. Um, but the, the overview, if you look at all 16 chapters of Mark, you can break it into three places. You can break it into the, and they're interestingly, the longest part of this gospel really, the most words is that last week, which says something about um, Mark. Um, but the first triptych is his ministry in Galilee. You know, it starts with him declaring Jesus to be the son of God and with John's baptizing him. No birth story. Um, and so we're going to spend a couple of weeks um, really looking at that ministry. 
And then the next um, piece of the gospel can is only in chapters nine to 11. And it, that, that segment, and we'll talk more about it when we get there, begins with the healing of a blind man and ends with the healing of another blind man. And I think it's Mark's way of saying, you disciples are all so blind. Mm. Uh, you know, he's on the way begins that chap, beginning of chapter nine begins with his transfiguration, where suddenly people realize, oh, this guy is more than just the, rap, the carpenter's son. And so we'll spend some time digging around in, in his ministry in, in Perea and the miracles that he works. Um, and then we will wrap up with that last one week, which, you know, all of us who've ever been to church on Easter, we know the story, but Mark tells it in an extraordinary way um, that all the other gospels had to assimilate and then consider, then wrote down in their own versions. But we will spend a couple of sessions in that first part of that triptych those first 2.5 years, but it's just, it's ironic to me that if you split it evenly, pretty much those first five, two, five point two five years have fewer words than that last week. Just something to, to notice. And did my screen freeze? No. Okay. So here's your background information. Um, his real name was John Mark. Um, and what to note there is that Mark- What? I'm listening to Liz on my phone. I'm gonna mute him. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, Dorothy Bacon. <laughs> um, two names, John Mark. John was a, it was a Hebrew name, a, a, is a name from the people in Israel, but Mark, Marcus, Marcus Aurelius, Mark Anthony was a Roman name. So we have some indication that he came from a wealthy family. Um, the fact that he wrote and spoke three languages was in a world that didn't have a whole lot of books was a pretty big deal. Um, and some um, Josephus, as well as um, Oh, Pope Papias, who was the, the, the Bishop of um, Hierapolis, which is later on, said that it was Mark's mother's house, probably, where the Last Supper occurred. So this is a, he's a wealthy kid. Um, his older cousin was Barnabas, who was one of the apostles. But it's interesting to note that Mark was not considered among those apostles. Um, he was too young. He was a young kid. He was running around with a, um, and we'll get into this, but some scholars say he was the one that ran away naked the night of um, when they were accusing him. So he was, he was part of us as helper. Um, what we also know about Mark is because Mark uh, Barnabas was his older cousin, um, he traveled with them um, when Paul started out um, evangelizing the world. Of course, if you were in the Acts course, um, you'd know, um, you remember those travels and you remember probably that big riff when um, Mark didn't go on with them. And then Paul and Barnabas actually split ways because Barnabas said, no, he's back. He may have left us, but he's back now. And, and they, it didn't work. So Barnabas went one direction, Paul went the other. Um, history, histories, um, the memoirs that were written in the second century tell us um, that Peter then started working, I'm sorry, that Mark started working for Peter as his scribe, again, because he had all those languages. Um, but because he had very little, he may have been at the Last Supper, or he may have been there when Jesus appeared and, and asked Thomas to poke his hand in his side, but he wasn't a, a major player at that point. Um, so he is stressing the works of Jesus rather than the words, because he probably wasn't there for the real teachings. He wasn't, there's no Sermon on the Mount that's 
you know, preached in this book, for example, um, he is talking about the works, not the words. Um, an interesting bit of trivia, but it speaks highly to Mark's theology is he only has four parables. When you think of all the parables that are in Matthew and Luke, but he does show 19 miracles. Again, he's showing the works of Jesus, not the words. Um, and then we go back to that word immediately, which appears those 41 times, or you know, as soon as, or quickly, suddenly. Um, when you think about what we know about Simon Peter, you know, it was Simon Peter that jumped out of the boat to go to Jesus. It was Simon Peter that said, don't do it that way, Jesus, you can't die. Simon Peter was impetuous. He had his own style. And I think the reason Mark sounds so uh, staccato um, was probably because he was listening only to Peter and hearing Peter's version of this. Um, so it's just something to think about. Hmm. Um, ultimately, he grew up um, and wrote this gospel for Peter. Peter approved it. I don't remember. It was a Vatican Council, and I don't remember the date, but it's out there if you want to find it. Um, and then ultimately took the gospel he wrote with him and moved to Egypt. And on Peter's say-so became the first bishop of Alexandria, which was, of course, where the big library was. I mean, it was the center of all African and uh, really Eastern um, learning. So the fact that he became the first bishop of um, Alexandria, I think this was a huge deal. Um, if you're looking in art, you will often see him um, writing because he was a scribe, but you will also often see, and I hope I have a picture somewhere here, maybe I think it's in next week's, there's a picture of, of this big lion. It almost looks like um, uh, Narnia. Help me out. Who's the lion in Narnia? Aslan. Aslan, Aslan thank you. It, it looks like Aslan's looking over his shoulder, but his symbol um, is this winged lion. Um, and then the key idea in this, which we will get to when we get to that middle triptych, um, and certainly the last week, that Jerusalem week, um, Jesus um, is being portrayed as the suffering servant. He's not coming in as the triumphant king of the Jews. He's not coming in as, the, as Jesus as God. He's coming in as I am here to help. I am not going to knock Rome out of the Middle East, but I am going to give you power uh, to heal people, to make people's lives better. Um, he is pivotal in that, um, in that ethos of being the suffering servant. Um, I'm going to stop talking for a minute and say, anybody got some questions? So um, I think what I'm going to do in this kind of overview is we're going to break into um, some small group discussions um, and just kind of review, whoops, what, I'm sorry about that, what in small groups um, surprised you about this young man? Um, were you aware that he, that he really wasn't one of the first called people? Um, as you know, Matthew was, as Peter was, um, and not having any face time with Jesus. How did he become the evangelist, Mark, the evangelist? <clears throat> what does that say about our responsibility and our ability to be evangelists ourselves? Um, and then the, the one that I really think I'd love to talk about when, when I bring you back and 10, 15 minutes is how do you proclaim the gospel? And, and we don't all have to be out as a, a friend of mine calls them Bible thumpers, um, but you know, give each other some ideas of um, how you share the good news of Christ in your own life with people that may or may not go to church. Or, um, how, do you, how do you do that work, which we're all called to do? 
I, let's see, stop the share. Hi, everybody. There you all are. Mm -hmm. I'm going to invite you to breakout rooms. Um, five breakout rooms, I think. And smooth. Thank you, Cammy. <laughs> Uh, so um, let's talk about some of those questions. Um, what surprised you about Mark? I never I realized he wasn't, that was, an he wasn't an apostle. Yeah. Well, I knew that he wasn't listed as an apostle, but he mm -hmm. wrote a gospel, so I kind of assumed he was a pseudo apostle. <laughs> it's really kind of surprising that he really, really wasn't a firsthand um, witness to all this going on. He was a younger boy, yeah. Ah. But he was so edu well educated, he had access to information through three different languages, which was fantastic for that era. Indeed. Do you know if he spoke Egyptian too, once he became the bishop in Alexandria? I don't know, I'll call him and ask. Okay. <laughs> that surprised me like too. That. that would be interesting. When you think I, of I, how there was no printing press, there were the scribes were the only ones that could read and write. The fact that he did speak Hebrew, Latin, and Greek is amazing. Amazing. Um, and I think, you know, who knows how? Per perhaps you know, it's like if you go to Paris versus rural France. You're going to find somebody who speaks English. And maybe when he got to Alexandria, he did that. Who knows? Yeah. Um, what else surprised you? His, his that, he, that he wrote the gospel from Peter. Uh, I had no clue. And I always wondered why there wasn't a gospel from Peter. I mean, he's like the head of the church. So now I know this is the gospel. I yeah. mean, that's very interesting to me. Yeah. <clears throat> is there any, uh, has any light been shed on the fact that Peter... Well, we, in the men's Bible group, we used to refer to him as uh, Joe Friday, which is an old TV show. Uh, <laughs> and Joe, yeah. Joe Friday we used to say, just the facts, ma'am. And Mark is really, he's so to the point. It's like feelings don't exist, but by God, facts are going to get in there. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it was as acting as scribe made it that focus. He wasn't going to guess about what people were feel, thinking or feeling. That was a real eye opener to me too. That Mark's gospel was um, written down from Peter's recounting, and he yeah. was a let's you know let's go let's go get get to the uh, center of the issue in person, and that's reflected in Mark's gospel. Yeah, very interesting to have that. Mm -hmm. I, I think that uh, everything surprised me, and I think the other two people in in the group would say the same thing that. We never had thought about who these people really were and what they did. We just take it for granted that Mark wrote this. Mm -hmm. um, and we're finding out why and and what for, you know, but really didn't know anything about the person. Well, and it's interesting, Brooke, that you say that. Having been in, in the Holy Land, and some of you may have been as well, um, but whenever you're with St. George's College, Jerusalem, they always take you to the place where the upper room was. Um, and, and it was, a, it's a whole, you can just tell it's a thin space. Um, but what fascinated me is having been in that house or the remains of it. Um, and it is right in the center of the old city among all the bazaars and, and you know, clothing stands and so forth um, was, to suddenly realize this was a guy's house. He had a wealthy mother, they had this big house and they could, the early church met at Mark's house. Um, so you're right, it, you, we learn that these are real people, real guys. Um, and you know, there's certainly scholarly work. Uh, there are scholars that would say, well, no, it really wasn't written by John Mark, but the, the evidence weighs back to the first and second centuries um, Papias being one, Justin Martyr being another, who, who did have written down notes about who these guys were. And so we, it was always the hardest thing when I first went to the Holy Land was to say, well, how do we know that this is where Priscilla went, went visited? But there are diaries that we do still have, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, did any of you get to the question um, about 
evangelism? Mm -hmm. Well, no, yeah. we did not. Okay, who yeah. did? We did. Yeah? Let's talk about that for a minute. Yeah. We're all called to do it. We're right. all scared of the E word. Yeah. And it's not a fiscal failure. Yeah. <laughs> I feel that I do it just in my everyday um, you know, interactions with people. Um, you know, through community, you know, kind acts, um, staying involved with people, um, helping um, when I can, um, and just trying to be a good example of what we're supposed to be um, as part of a community. And yeah. So not Bible thumping. No, not Bible thumping. Um, right. that, that, that one's not on, on my radar. Right. No. And not running up to somebody and shaking them by the shoulders and saying, you got to try it up. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a little bit of a turnoff. That was a Catholic thing in my day. I'm in my 80s and still pretty healthy. But in northern Ohio, uh, back in the, oh, I guess that would be in the 60s, 50s, uh, even 40, or late 40s, uh, evangelizing was strictly a matter of Protestantism. And if you were Catholic, that, like you said before, uh, Liz, uh, then it was associated not with Episcopalianism, but, but with Catholics. And we didn't hear the word Epis evangelize hardly in our church ever. Uh, but it did change over years. And I guess the idea for me of evangelizing is to be, to try to keep my mouth shut and my ears open and answer any questions that come my way or ask an occasional uh, provocative question. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you guys had a really great discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. In our group, we talked about um, looking for opportunities rather than um, being overt about going up to people and mm -hmm. directly telling them about Jesus or directly uh, quoting the Bible, but I think. You know, inviting people to church is one way I think that uh, you know, for special occasions, for example, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, to have somebody come with you to a special function <clears throat> can sometimes yeah. be a way in. But you know, I think relying too heavily on the uh, you may be the only Bible some people see, I think you miss some, I think I've missed some opportunities by not being more open about my church at all. Mm. And I don't like the um, you know, pushing it on people, but just in my in conversation, talking about it, talking about the things uh, we do. What did you do Sunday? Oh, I went to church and this is what happened. So, you know, it's a balance for me. It, it's uh, living my life so that hopefully people wonder what makes me tick. Uh, and some people ask, but also looking for opportunities to invite people. In. And I think it is an invitation. It's not a challenge. Well, um, Diane invited Diane Brost here on this on my screen. Um, has over the past couple of years, because we were very, you know, we were both from our very Catholic backgrounds and have known each other for the length like of time our boys were 35. Um, have known each other. So um, she's been inviting me over the past um, couple of years. And finally, with the Bible study in December, uh, I jumped on that. And then um, we have, I have been to church um, several times. A lot. Yeah, before all my injuries. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and, and we are delighted to have you, Joe. Right. And I'm what a wonderful to asset. Bob Moore once I heal here. Yeah. And thanks for all your prayers. Yeah, I think it's it's not in your face to evangelize. You just talk mm -hmm. about the the happiness, the joy you get from attending this church, and and that's what I did with Joanne is just yeah. saying, oh yeah, you know, we just did, you know, just in conversation, and uh, we were talking about some other things that we're passionate about, and I said, oh, you know what? There's this woman in the Bible study that's coming up, and I knew like women, you know, in leadership and things like that are important to her. 
And she's like, really? You guys are doing that? And I'm like, yeah. I said, just let me on Zoom, you know, if you're interested, yeah. you try it out. She's like, okay. And yeah. so it was like very non-confrontational. Um, it was just yeah. conversational. It was just like, yeah. you know, another part of life and, you know, finally right. getting up, I don't know, the Catholic courage, guilt, um, <laughs> which is Liz has said, you know, there's no guilt with you guys. Yeah. Didn't get um, struck by thunder. <laughs> Let's take that. Okay, I am. I have the choice to take that step. I mean, I'm not giving up religion altogether, but I ha had that chance to take a step into something new. And I mean, I have learned so much since December. Um, it's just like, whoa, you know, I'm kind of overwhelmed sometimes. Show us, show us your arm. Oh, I think oh. I know. What? I fell. I fell off a piece of gym equipment three weeks ago and broke both bones. And last Friday, I had surgery, and I have one plate. And yes, so. But I am on the mend again. Yay! <laughs> healing is a miracle. Yeah, healing is a miracle, and I'm just I'm the queen of cluts. So you know, <laughs> all is good. You know, you get up and brush yourself off and try to go again. <laughs> all right, hello. But it's your right hand. Are you right-handed? I am right-handed, so of yes. You are. Yeah. But so I'm right. I think, I think, maybe I'm wrong, but I think Episcopalian evangelism is dropping bait and not being annoyed if somebody doesn't take the bait. Oh, okay. Bait. Say more. Bait. bait, right. What, uh, I, uh, Christine, not, not to interrupt you, but Christine used the word opportunities. Is that what you're saying as well, kind of dropping bait? Mm -hmm. it, yeah. What are some of the opportunities or what are your base? Right. It's like pornography. I know it when I see it, but it's hard to define. <laughs> hard to define. <laughs> I want to write that down. I don't know, that's going to make it a sermon someday, Martha. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry to embarrass you over the year. Friends. Yeah. Diane has well, baked me over the years with all the good things that she's done and seen um, with her participation at St. Tim's. Um, and I saw, I've seen how it's made, changed, you know, made her much happier with her faith journey. Um, so it was just like, it kind of encouraged me to finally, you know, take that step. You know, sometimes it takes a while, you know, what does it take a couple of years, Diane? Um, and it, you know, and it's all part of your evolution as a person, as far as I'm concerned, um, and moving into different directions. Um, I, may I speak for just a moment? Sure. Just my, um, my wife and I are going to be moving this summer, uh, late summer, maybe early fall, to a oh. totally different, totally different part of the country after being at St. Oh. for 40 years. Wow. And it's, mm. it's because of our grandchildren, we're finally going to be able to live near where they are and 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 my wife and I both were teachers and we were very private people but St. Tim's has really been a, a wonderful home and I'm but I am just hoping that one of the things that that changes is that the St. Tim's goes back to what it was doing long time ago at least 20 years 30 years ago and that is there were more opportunities for men to get together and talk and to get together with women, their wives, whatever, girlfriends, and share activities. It seems to me like more and more we're, Americans were driven into corners, so to speak, and, and branded a certain kind of a certain kind of thing. Uh, going to a new part of the country, I expect to run into a lot of new people I don't know, and I, I'm hoping I'll have a chance to to evangelize, as you say, you guys say, and and bring the good news. So I'm going to miss you guys terribly in St. Tim's, but I hope to stay some, at least somewhat in, in contact. So just had to speak my piece. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you, hey, and my Thanks. friend, we're going to miss you too. And I hope you can use these opportunities when they aren't happening at Oh God 100 to join us. Um, oh. <laughs> Mike's, in, Mike's in a Bible study with me that meets at seven o'clock central time. And we said to him, so you're going to have to get up at five to be on your game. <laughs> but we're going we're gonna to find him a good church. And, and uh, <laughs> I wish uh, I wish we'd been able to to uh, for the choir to participate in the service this summer. I've been a singer all my life, strictly an amateur. And I really miss the opportunity to, to sing with others and help the congregation enjoy and 
and uh, participate more fully. I know I, I used to tell friends that my way of praying is to sing and yeah. I just miss mm -hmm. that terribly. So I hope St. Tim's comes back, roaring back. And I think under Mark's leadership, uh, it will. But you ladies, go after those teenagers who are not people who play sports a lot when they're 12 or 13 or 14 or 15, get them into a junior choir. Mark, Mark is one of the best choir directors I have ever had. And I mean, in 30, 40, 50 years, he's really good, but he needs encouragement and help. So if you've got relative or whatever, or friend or son, daughter, you know, encourage John them. John Paul II said, those who sing pray twice. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Yeah, oh. I think I heard that. Indeed. So um, I'm remembering somebody, Somebody, are we still on? Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, my screen just changed. Um, somebody mentioned 30 years ago or more, and I'm remembering when I first moved to Bellingham, Washington, and was beginning my career as a social worker. Mm. And maybe that's part of my evangelism that I chose that career. But at that time, all the people I knew were doing work in agencies that helped people and hardly anyone made a good salary, you know, it was very mm -hmm. modest salary. And we um, were serving, we were serving the people and none of those people were churched, including myself at that time. And a lot of us realized we had been raised Catholic and Jewish and had incorporated those values when we were quite young. And so to me, that's a kind of evangelism, you know, and now I think of something like going to help with the peace meal is evangelism for me. It's, it's the doing of the thing, it's serving, it's um, offering time and kindness. And it's not trying to convince other people that they should be doing what I'm doing. And that goes way back for me that, mm -hmm. um, I started a preschool religion program in my Catholic church many years ago, and we got some training and this guy said, Jesus may or may not be everyone's answer. So when you're doing this work, you need to remember that, that there's all kinds of spiritual paths. So anyway, I just wanted to say that. Thank you, Noreen. Um, I do think, I think we come together and worship with like-minded folks and that's why we have creeds and things. And yet we are all sent out no matter where we are worshiping God um, into a world in dire need of compassion and love and peace. And I think you just articulated that beautifully and I'd forgotten the Bellingham connection that we had. Uh -huh. I'm going to move us forward because I'm aware of the time um, and don't leave at the closing prayer because there's a screenshot after this. Oh yeah, here's my picture of Aslan. Isn't that fabulous? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Oh, wow. um, do you remember the uh, John Mark <clears throat> that he that is a Hebrew name and a Roman name? And so there was something to his uh, ability to do all those languages. Uh, but first, let us pray, and then I'll tell you what we're going to do next week. Almighty God, who by the hand of Mark, the evangelist, you have given to your church the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We thank you for this witness and pray that we may be firmly grounded in its truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. His feast day, by the way, I don't know if I ever said that, is uh, April 25th. So maybe we can take Mark, uh, take, uh, have Mark do something for an even song next year on that day. Um, so um, this is another one of those studies where Cammie and I went, yeah, we're going to make them do work too. <laughs> And um, so back to that screen where I said, this is a, a triptych lesson. Yeah. Um, we are in that first triptych um, next week. And I'm gonna have you read the first two chapters, um, but do go into that verse three, six as well, just because it's, it's part of that. Um, if, you knew that, if you know, or you've probably heard, the Bible was never written with chapters and verses. So these are later additions and the chapter Chapter two really ends at chapter three, verse six. So if you look at that, what we're gonna start with next week is
we're going to just kind of do a group uh, conscience, a group uh, brainstorm of, yeah, I'm sorry, Martha. Um, we're going to do a brainstorm of uh, what are the events in chapters one and two. Um, and then um, I want you all, I, I, I am a cradle Episcopalian, but I'm going to have us all memorize Mark 1.1. And the reason I say that is Mark 1.1 1, 1, um, is Mark's statement of faith. And it's probably the only sentence in the entire scripture that gives his opinion rather than Peter's. And here it is. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. That's what Mark believed. The rest of the chapters are all Peter's words. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's Mark. Mm. He knew. Um, and that's important for us as we go forth and kind of dig into this, this thing. Um, so chapters, and you don't have to read. You can show up if you haven't read it, but scan it. Jot down what, occur, what you think are the most five important events in chapters one and two. Um, and I'm doing that for a reason. But um, I just want you all to, to realize that um, he's got a reason for writing the way he does. And, um, and we, need to be, we need to be aware of why he's writing in the way he is. Aware. Oh, it's so weird. Sometimes my voice just pops up on the side speaker. Um, some closing thoughts. <clears throat> Be looking when you're reading for the differences that you feel between the Gospel of Mark and the other three books. Um, for example, as you as we're reading through this short book, um, you'll notice that Mark leaves out a, a number of stories that are reiterated throughout um, Matthew, Luke, and John, such as the Sermon on the Mount I mentioned, uh, the lack of a birth narrative, um, the his appearance after the discovery of the empty tomb. Um, and then a lot of the parables are left out. I mentioned he only does four parables. So when we, when we get to that part in the study, let's take note of which parables he does include. Um, and then maybe let's make a list in the future weeks of, you know, what are the miracles that these 19 that the others didn't write down? So, um, so that's it. Um, God bless you all. And thank you for attending. And I look forward to working slogging through this gospel with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you, you for giving this to us. Thanks for Appreciate coming. It. Thanks for being here. Love you all and we'll see you next week. Thank you. This has Bye. been spectacular. All right. Bye. Bye.